you guys can go ahead and be seated. Uh, were we going to do another testimony? Tracy, would you like to come forward and give your testimony from this from this weekend, right? You can go. You can stay down there. And sit. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I was here last night. Wasn't able to make the other um, two dates, but I sat over here, my normal, typical spot, and I came in and I just said, "God, I need an answer. I need to know: Do I stay or do I go? Do I hold on or do I let go? I need to know what you want from me because it's your will that I want." And I sat there, and even during worship, um, the little lady that was up here said, "Those of you that are seeking answers." just praise him while you're waiting Amen. and I was like okay so I began to praise him and then um, they had the service and um, I sat there and she called said anybody that wants prayer come up and I stayed in my seat and I was like I got my answer you know I'm going to praise him while I'm waiting and she called me out and I was shocked so I came up and um, long story short there were some things in there that were confirmation a little bit for me about yeah I need to stay and hold on and um, don't give up and that restoration's coming and, and I'm just holding on and waiting on that restoration and praising him through it and I needed that last night because I've been strong but I um, some things had happened and I had um, tripped and fallen and lost a little bit of my confidence and um, wasn't sure if I had heard right from God and the devil is really good about telling you that yeah. you didn't hear right that's not what he wants from you 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 know you were mistaken and yeah. you've been wasting your time and um, he's a liar he's a liar and I'm here to tell you that right. stand on that first word and if you need an answer just praise him while you're waiting and don't be afraid to just ask for help um, I'm not one that readily asks for help I I keep things close there's a few in the, in the church that know my situation but um, I'm I'm praising him in this storm and I'm thanking my Sandy and Cinnamon and Larry and their family she said your your holidays are not going to be what they were but that family back there has taken me in I have no family in this town really but they have been my family Chelsea and Jason and all of them so um, keep praising them that's, that's all I got thank you thank you I can tell spring's here. It's getting warm. My eyes are sweating. Yeah. It's over 50 degrees. Every pore in my body is starting to sweat. Uh. Are you sure you don't want to preach? No. Just kidding. wonder if you feel what I feel. You know, I mean, how many of you have ever been to a movie, been to a church service, been to whatever, and you walk out of that thing and one person got absolutely nothing and the other person takes a completely different aspect of it. So I always, I always wonder, you know, what's going on? You know, what happens in church? I mean, I've been to lots of church services where I sat through mostly with bad attitude and stuff like that. And I walked out and I'm like, man, God wasn't in that place. <laughs> right. <laughs> May have been me, right? Uh, just may have been. I'm not wrong very often, uh, but that may have been one of those times. Um, you know, so I wonder that, but, but I really, I really feel a, a wonderful sense of God here today. Uh, and not just because I'm preaching, not because I'm going to do it. I, just, I really felt it early this morning. Uh, I had my alarm set. I woke up way before my alarm. Just with whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
I wish I was really good with words. <laughs> I wish I was really good at not crying. <laughs> no, I want to keep it nice and close to me. Uh, I have a feeling I might need that whole box. Uh, All right. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Make my heart stand up. I've got about six messages that I've tried to combine into one today. Uh, really, uh, Cooper was with me yesterday, and I was asking him to... I got kids camp notes and kids camp applications and I got to put some stuff down here. Don't let me forget that stuff, please. But he was with me yesterday and I said, buddy, I said, you got to, you got to pray for me. I said, I know I've got stuff to say, but it's like, which thing do you go off of? You know, there's so many things. I mean, how many of you, uh, don't raise your hands or anything, but just, just think about it. I mean, how many times do you go through a day and you just experience, not necessarily that you have to have a message or what, whatever, but you just experience something of God and you want to share with share that with somebody. Well, you, you know, as that happens very often, sooner or later, you're like, oh, I gotta, ha- I don't have enough outlets to get this stuff out, and so that kind of happens sometimes. And I'm, I, I was trying to figure out, God, how do you put this stuff together? So I threw a title on this thing. I don't know if this title's going to fit. Um, but the thought is in there somewhere, if I can get to it. Okay? But I want you guys to, uh, we'll probably start in the Old Testament. Um, 1 Samuel. And here's what I want you to do. How many of you have ever seen the movie Men in Black? Now, I don't know about any of the new ones. I just remember the original one. Okay, the one with, with Will Smith and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name. Tommy Lee Jones, yeah. And and there's this part where they pull this pin thing out, right? Because of stuff that they've seen and there's a look right here. It's called a nebulizer. And they like click it and it erases their memory. I wanted to look, I want you to look at the nebulizer today. Look at it real close. I'm going to click it and erase your memory. Because what happens sometimes is we come back to a scripture that we've heard preached a thousand times and we automatically start drawing conclusions and ideas and well he should have went this way or I would have taken it that way. And you start playing all these things out when you think you know what's going on. And I'm not trying to say that I've got something brand new. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say I'm going to enlighten you today with something that you've never heard before. But I want you to not go to that place where, okay, I've heard this before. It's a, it's a popular scripture, right? One that we read a lot. Uh, but I've somehow uh, got 17 scriptures to fit into this little message. Uh, and my goal today was to get you out in time for brunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when some people found out I was preaching today, I said, hey, you better call the restaurant, change your reservation, because you're going to be a little bit earlier today. <laughs> At least if you're waiting on me to preach. I mean, if, who knows what God's going to do, but as far as my part's concerned, uh, honest, honest to goodness, if I could do it the way that I wanted to, yeah. I'd say about two sentences. <laughs> And you should have such a receptivity in your spirit that you respond to God and I just walk away. Because the truth is, all you, all you should have to do is read a scripture and we should be so excited about it that we just respond and do what we're supposed to do. The problem in America is that we've gotten so used to so many crafted and talented people that the, that the level has to keep going higher and higher and higher in order to entertain and keep our attention. I made this mistake when I started dating Jenny. Pastor Jack uh, busted me out a couple weeks ago <laughs> about being a little bit older than my wife. And uh, see, there's, there's a learning curve there, though. See, the problem was I had been doing, a th- doing some things a certain way all my life, trying to drown out stuff that had happened. And when God said, that's your wife, I only knew how to do, do a, guy, a, a man's way. I got to start dating her if she's going to be my wife. What I didn't realize was he was setting me up for something farther in the future that if I would have left my hands off of it, God could have done so much more. See, the truth was is she was probably ready. I don't even know if I'm still ready. I was so jacked up. 
right? I was damaged goods, right? It takes a long time. Okay. And uh, so anyway, the, the, the thing was, you know, I was in my 20s when, when, I, when, God, when I felt like God sh uh, showed me out there that she was supposed to be my wife. Yeah. And, that was, and so we went on our first date on December 3rd. This has nothing to do with my notes. I don't know why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> December 3rd, 1991. Uh, we went on our first date, and our first date w was a uh, birthday party, right? Yeah. Christmas party, that's what I meant, Christmas party. <laughs> Christmas party with about 75 other people. Right. I showed up separate in my own car and went looking for the Guffy family because that's who my date was with, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> And that, that carried on for about the next two years. Uh, uh, different members of the Guffy family just about everywhere. And then every once in a while, if a Guffy uh, member wasn't available, I had to reach out to Jason, who was my best friend. And we went on, on, a, on a, uh, a, a, a triplet date where he sat in the back seat and we sat in the front seat and I drove. And no, it was Anyway. But the point was, I'm saying all that, I gave you all that information because of this. I started out too hot. Now let me explain that because some of you just went in the gutter real quick, <laughs> right? Because I'm like, I remember, I came out of the world. I've been doing my own thing, even though I knew God, came to church, was filled with the Holy Ghost, been baptized, but I was running and doing my own thing. I only knew the world's way of winning a woman, right? And so for like the next seven Christmases and birthdays, I mean, I was doing my best to spoil her, to know, to let her know that I, I, was, I had some good intentions, you know, like I'm not, I'm not just this fly by night boyfriend. I'm in it for the long haul. And so the, those Christmas presents and stuff, I started out too hot in the beginning. You, you know, you got, you got to start small and build up. Because see, what I didn't know was happening is what happens when you have kids and mortgages and all that other stuff and you don't have all that spendable cash, you know? The card doesn't go as far now as it would have, you know, 20 years ago. Like a card 20 years ago, I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. Now it's a card. No, I'm just kidding. She, she accepts them, you know, be like, oh, uh, where's the diamond ring? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Right? But I, I started out too hot, and that, that's what we do sometimes. We get used to these things, and that's what happens in, in, in America with all the teaching and preaching and lights and everything else that goes into it. We have so many talented people that we got to keep raising the standard in order to break through yeah. our comfortableness, our callousness, whatever it's called. Okay, I'm going to get to my message. Yeah. That was 11 minutes of free stuff. I gave Dad a hard time the other day saying that he gave a 15 minute introduction and I just gave you 11 minutes and 50 seconds. <laughs> um, <laughs> I rebuke that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? Um, I told you to go to 1 Samuel 17, right? Yeah. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We all know the story of David and Goliath, right? But I, I really want to kind of challenge you a little bit to look at it with a little bit different eyes today. And I hope maybe I can, I can touch on this. I'm not going to read a lot of the scripture because most of, how, just raise your hand if you are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Oh, yeah. Right, should be a lot of us in church. The truth is, is hopefully whenever we do that, that there are some people in here that have never heard of that story. That's right. That's right. That'd be good. Otherwise, we need to really go back and reevaluate what church is all about. Yeah. Because if, if there are people in our church that don't know the, or that do know all these things and don't know about them, then we're not doing our job outside the walls. Right. right. So anyway, that's another freebie. I might as well just shut this thing because I haven't preached one thing out of it yet. First uh, Samuel chapter seventeen. We know that, that Goliath came out and he began to taunt. And there's, there's been lots of speculation and lots of preaching done on like how much his armor weighed, how tall he was, where he came from, how, how uh, his three older brothers were in the war and he was just coming to bring bread and grain and all those different things, right? We, we've all kind of heard those things. And those things fascinate me because I love finding out all that little detail. I was going to bring one of my kettlebells in here because... 
it says the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. Just the tip of his spear. Okay, he was over nine foot tall. So imagine how long his spear was. How many of you have ever tried to hold something out on, on the end of a pole or something? My dad used to do this trick when he was a little, when I was a little kid, and he was working construction a lot. He used to take a, a sledgehammer and hold it straight out, and he would tilt that thing back and let it touch his nose and then bring it back up. And that it always impressed me as a little kid. Kids, don't go home and try that. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you do, make sure that you're on Instagram or YouTube or something like that, uh, because and then you owe me some of the credits when that goes viral. Okay. Um, you, you know, but the, the tip of his spear was 15 pounds. You know, that, that, those things just amaze me. I heard one person say that his his shield alone was probably 250 pounds. Right? Just a massive, massive man. And we see that thing. But here's here's the thing that always gets me. Because, and, and don't hate me right now, but sometimes I think we give David too much credit for the story. Because we always go into, and we talk about how David was unafraid, and we talk about how maybe David was going after uh, the wife and all the bounty that came if he slayed Goliath. And we talk about, you know, because he went against a lion and a bear that he knew that he could go against Goliath. And all these different things. And all that may be true. But the reason that he did it is because Goliath was taunting them and talking bad about his God. Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole reason that he did that. Yeah. The whole reason that he decided to step up. Yeah, all the extra stuff is, is, is good. That's just a bonus, right? But the reason that he went after him wasn't to get a wife. It wasn't to gain fame. It was because I can't stand that person talking about my God that way. What would happen if, uh, if a society of Christians would begin to start acting that way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, we can go through the whole story. I had different parts I was going to bring out of that and everything, and I don't know if I'm going to or not. Start in verse 8. It said, Goliath stood, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. I apologize to the media team. I didn't give you anything today. So I'm trusting for the spirit of interpretation today that he will give it to you ahead of time. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then you will be, or then, I, then we will be your slaves. If I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And it continues to go on, and it goes against. Or, or, continues to talk about all these things. And down in verse 26, David was asking his soldiers and said, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he should, uh, that, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Who is he that he's, I know that he's a champion. I know that he's mighty. I know that he's huge. But really, who is he? Do you not know who God is? And here's what I love about this. And if you, if you kind of do some of the studies, you got to understand some things. More than likely, the way that this battle was to be fought, the reason he said, why are you bringing all these armies? He was the only champion. He was the greatest soldier in the Philistine army. Right. And in most cases, if, you, if you've seen the movie Troy uh, years ago, there, there was a scene that was similar to this. Yeah. Most of the stuff that you see in movies are stuff that's kind of taken out and completely twisted and warped from the Bible. Yeah. Because there's this battle between Brad Pitt and this great big monster looking man. Right. And it was about the two champions. Who's your best? Yeah. And, and instead of killing everybody, let's just send out our two best and find out who, who's the best army. Yeah. So really, who should have been going out to battle in this one? David. Was David there? Yeah, Saul, right? <laughs> Remember the song that came up that Saul started getting jealous about? Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Thousands, right? right. right? Yeah. Up until this point, David wasn't a warrior. Right. right. David was a shepherd. Right. Okay. Now, there's debate on whether or not he, whether or not he was old enough to be in the army because you were supposed to be 20 years old in order to get in the army. But if you look, if you read through the scripture, it 
says that he went back and forth. Okay, because he was still trying to honor his father and take care of his flocks. And this was after he had already been anointed by Samuel to be the king. Okay? So we, we see this. So I'm this is just me, this is just my thinking. I haven't studied it out. I know there's lots of people in here that you have greater knowledge and understanding of these things. But I'm thinking, Cooper, come here. You're my son, I can pick on you. <laughs> All right. Come on up here. It's your, your moment to shine. Get right under this light. No, I'm just kidding. All right. 12 years old. Okay. Cooper's 12 years old. All right. Now, here's my, here's my thinking pattern on this. If David isn't old enough to be in the army where there's battle going on, why would he be allowed to come back and forth to the battlefield? Yeah. Right? right? It didn't say that he came to the camp. It said that he went to the front lines where, the, where, the, where he saw Goliath taunting. Right. right? Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from the fact that David, even if he was 20, he wasn't a warrior. We, we know that for a fact. Right. Right? right? But even, you know, Cooper's a pretty good-sized boy. He takes after his mom. <laughs> Right? And, and we wrestle, and, and he does this thing where he's like, Dad, let me choke you out. And uh, that's, that's the kind of way we play at home. That's how Lyric ended up with a broken ankle. Um, <laughs> And he's getting pretty good. You know, how many dads know, like, when you start getting to that age where your boy starts punching you back, you know, you play that little game, right? And you start pushing and shoving, and all of a sudden you're like, uh oh. Right? I'm going to have to get back in the gym, right? Like, uh, I'm getting older and weaker. He's getting older and stronger. Something's wrong here, right? But even though he knows how to handle himself, and even though he knows how to do some things, I'm not going to let him come to the battlefield. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to allow him close to that, right? I'm not going to allow him near that danger. But his dad says, go check on the boys, right? Yeah. How many of you know, no matter how old you get, your dad's always going to call you your boy? Yeah. I'm going to be 49. My dad still introduces me as his son, his boy. This is my grown boy. This is my man child. I'm still baby Rusty, right? <laughs> Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> Right? <laughs> 290 pound baby right here, you know? <laughs> oh, you said you sweet little guy, <laughs> right? But you understand what I'm saying about David? You, you understand this, okay? Now, I want you to realize when you read through there, and especially if you read King James and you go back and study through some things, it says when, when David began to um, uh, talk to Saul, he said, you don't understand. God has delivered me. We probably need to go here. We probably need to go here. Because I'm going to mess it up. You're right. Go over to verse 32. Okay. He said, don't worry about this Philistine, he told Saul. I'll fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul. Probably we know those things, right? This, boy's, this guy's been fighting in war since he was youth. Verse 20 or 34. <laughs> But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club. Now, that's different than King James or New King James. Yeah. Okay, and I'll get to that in a second. I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I'll catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Okay? I've done both to the lions and the bears, and I'll do this to this pagan Philistine who uh, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Yeah, Lord. Now is David's confidence in the fact that he has a club or a sling? Yeah. He says what he's used. He's used what he's had in his life. Because when you look at it in the King James, it says that he'll, he smote or he, he, he uh, it said that he smite, I think. I can't remember exactly what it says. But if you look that up, when it says those things, it goes through a whole list of things that it could be okay either way let's say it was the sling when you read it in the king james it says that when he he he, he smote the lion and the bear he ran over rescued the lamb or the goat from its mouth and when the lion and the bear got up it says that he he killed it so he, here's my thinking if I've used a slingshot before on a lion and a bear, and it didn't kill him, it only just tased him for a little bit until I could rescue it and then kill it, yeah. I, th 
think I want to use something different against a nine foot man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it doesn't say that. The other thing, I mean, these are just things that go through my head. Yeah. If he carries his slingshot all the time, which he probably did, why didn't he have any rocks? We probably have some, some people in here that have your concealed carry, right? How many of you concealed carry with your gun only? <laughs> what's, the, what's the point, right? You might as well just carry a microphone. <laughs> right? Sneak up behind it, stick in their back and say, hey. <laughs> All right? you, you're not going to do anything with it. You can beat him just as bad with this microphone as you can with a 9 millimeter. The purpose is, is, the, is the weapon that's, or the bullets that are in it, the ammunition that's in it. And so I'm going through all these things and I'm thinking about those things. But you know what? The thing that I love here is David didn't realize that his destiny was on the line that day. He just knew that someone was defying his God, talking trash about his God. And he just reacted out of instinct. And see, the thing is, is if we're not careful, we'll tie up our destiny in one battle. But that destiny was just a destination along the way to his destiny. Because here was his destiny. His destiny, the Goliath stood in front of him that day. And he stood in between his destiny. Yeah, because his destiny wasn't just to kill Goliath. Because what you don't realize probably is the way that they would do battle back then is if, if David or anyone from Israel would have lost that day and Goliath won, what would happen is they would go through and enslave everyone. And when they enslaved them, most likely they would take the men as slaves. And oftentimes what they would do to the male slaves is they would castrate them so that they could no longer produce. Yeah. So that he would steal the seed of that nation. Right. Not only would he do that to the men, then they would go through and any woman that was pregnant, they would cut her belly and abort the child that was in it because they didn't want any more of that tribe producing. On, Not only would they stop there, then they would take any woman that was of childbearing age and then they would impregnate them with Philistine seed. So that they could completely dominate and squash out any chance of that nation rising up against them. We see it happen with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, there was some common practices. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, we don't know that that was going to happen, but if you study some of the history, more than likely that was the chance. Because see, what you don't realize is David's destiny wasn't going to be king. His destiny wasn't going to be to defeat Goliath. His destiny was the fact that he carried the seed of Jesus. Because Jesus Christ, future generations down the road, road came from the loins of David. I'm getting excited. I'm spitting all over the place. So I want you to think about that today. I haven't even got to the New Testament part of my scriptures yet. I want you to think about this. Your destiny today is not what are you going to do when you get out of college. Your destiny today is not to be a stay-at-home mom. Your destiny today is not to be a great iron worker, a great garbage worker, a teacher. Your destiny is not in your occupation. That's just a destination along the way to your destiny. Because in you is the destiny of future generations. And if the Word of God stops in you because you get sidetracked by the occupation that you're in, you've lost that generation that leads. See, the truth is today, guys, <laughs> I get excited right here because I'm not standing up here today because of my destiny. I'm standing up here today because I'm part of His destiny. Because, see, you got to understand some things about some family trees. Anybody got some family trees out there? Some of you got some that, that you'd like to, to grow, let grow over the fence so that nobody sees them, right? <laughs> some of you got some that you don't trim up. You know, the ones that you want everybody to see, you trim it all nice and neat. I got a, 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 two apple trees in our backyard. One of them I try to keep looking decent. The other one looks like, I don't even know what. It's bad. Because <laughs> no one can really see it. And I don't really care. But the other one I wanted to look like, oh, that's a pretty apple tree, especially when it gets apples on it, right? But some of us got some family tree that we're trying to hide. See, in our family tree, there's a lot of things that we'd like to hide, right? There's a lot of things back there that we're trying to get away from. 
But when you begin to answer the call of God on your life, maybe it is stay at home mom. Maybe it is iron worker. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to get all of you to change your jobs today. I'm not trying to change any of that. I'm trying to get you to understand that that's just one part of your destiny. And when you begin to understand who you are in Christ, you will begin to accomplish the things that God has for you. Isn't it funny that we love to quote, quote that scripture? I think it's in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I don't know how it all goes, but it says something about he won't give you more than you can bear. Be, be tempted beyond what you can bear. Right. We love to quote that one, right? But how many of you know that also works in reverse? God's not going to give you more blessings than what you're able to bear either. Because he knows your future plans. He may have wonderful things in store for you, but he can't give those to you if you're not ready for it. That's right. Who knows what destinies lay in this place, what wonderful blessings and opportunities lay here, but because we're not doing our part, we may never see them because we haven't answered that. We get caught up where we're at. Yeah. And so I want you to go to, to look. I have so much stuff here, doggone it. <laughs> See, the fiery furnace was a Goliath to the Hebrew children. Oh, boy. Where, did I tell you where to go in the New Testament? Luke. Yeah, good. I'm better than I thought it was. Luke. Uh, man, I got so much there. Um, I'm just, can I just tell you the two stories instead of going there? Sure. <laughs> Uh, you get caught up in religious traditions, you'll leave here and you're like, well, he didn't even read one Bible verse today. How are we supposed to get anything from God on that? <laughs> right? I'm giving you Bible, you just got to go to it. Yeah. I'll tell you where they're at in Luke chapter 8 and John chapter 4. Do your homework, read them. <laughs> All right? <laughs> so in one place, Jesus is on his way. There's so much in this story of the parable of the woman with the issue of blood. How many of you have heard that? Not the parable, but the story of the woman with the issue of blood. How many of you have heard that story, right? <laughs> Anybody ever put the, the, the things together that she had it for 12 years? and also at the same time Jairus' daughter was 12 years old? Ah, no. So when one, when, when one's issue started, the life of the other one started. They were both 12 years old. One was suffering for 12 years, one was living for 12 years. That's not in the notes, we'll do that later. But at that time, he was going through on his way to heal the daughter, but all of a sudden the woman with the issue of blood comes up, interrupts his plans, Right? If, we get, if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in our programs and routines and the things that we're supposed to do, the structure of life, that we will completely miss the opportunities for God to show up. Yeah. I wonder how many, this is, this is, again, this is my mind and the way it thinks. One of the things I think is going to happen, I have no, no doctrine for this. This is just my thought. But when we get to heaven and we're kind of looking back over things, I think one of the things that, that might happen is we're going to look back over our life and see all the opportunities and treasures and things that God had for us yeah. that we missed and we will realize that there's absolutely no reason that we should enter into heaven. But because of the graciousness of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, he, still, he can still welcome us in. But it's gonna be, I think it's just going to be one of those things. You get so caught up. And at the end of the day, my prayer every day is God open my eyes to see the things that are happening around me so that I can join where you're working. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, many times I'm like, did I try around blind all day today or what? Because I didn't see anything, but God says that his mercies are new every morning. So it's there. I'm just not observant enough to see them. How many of you ever play that game with your kids? I spy. I spy with my little bitty itty eye. You know, my kids would, would expand that thing. With my itsy bitsy teeny weeny little tiny blue light colored eye, I see. <laughs> you know, right? And we go through those things and we think about them. But here's what's happening. He healed the woman with the issue of blood, and by the time that that was done, his daughter was already dead. But if you read further in the story, he tells him, don't worry, because he already knew the power and the authority that he had, because the number 12 is God's power and authority, yeah. right? And it was multiplied twice in that very instance. The woman with the issue of blood had the number 12. The woman, or the girl that needed to be healed was the number 12, so it was multiplied right there. The power and the authority of God, and Jesus was operating in it, and he said, don't worry about it. He didn't worry about the plans that he had. He didn't worry about the fact that he was running late. 
even though that they were worried. So we don't let the worries and cares of everybody else around us mess us up when we understand who we are and what our destiny is. See, sometimes what happens in today, we got the drama, and we get all caught up in the drama, and we're missing what we're supposed to be doing because we're caught up in the drama of everybody else. Right? Yeah. And so if you read on further in there, it says that when he gets to Jairus' house, if I, if I got my story right, this is the part where he puts everyone else outside the room. <laughs> Sometimes you got to put some stuff outside the room in order for you to fulfill your destiny. You got to get rid of some things in your life in order to see the miracles that God has waiting for you. I wonder how many times in my life have I been holding on to things that had nothing to do with God, but uh, the reason that I didn't see the miracles, maybe the reasons I was walking around with blinded eyes that day, was because I had too much of the cares of the world on me that I couldn't see what God was doing. And that's what Jesus did. He put them out of the room. He was wasn't worried about offending anybody. Right. Isn't that funny? Right. Like today, we're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here for, to pray, but I don't want to offend you right now, but your foul language and everything else, that's really just kind of interrupting the flow of the Spirit right now. Can I ask you to step out of the room because I got something to do on the way to my destiny? Right? The other thing that messes us up is we get thinking that it's our destiny. <laughs> it's not our destiny. Teenagers all the time wondering, what's my purpose? Why am I here? What's my destiny? It's not your destiny. It's his destiny. Yeah. We're just walking in it to fulfill it, to, to accomplish those things, to further the kingdom of God. The other one is in Luke chapter 4. I love this one. Or John 4, John 4, John chapter 4. The woman at the well, right? Yeah. Yeah. The other, one of the other ones that we see Jesus at 12 years old, another 12, right? When he, when he goes to the temple and his parents can't find him, right? And, and, and you read it and they're like, why did you do this to us? We've been looking for you. And he was like, basically he was like, why are you worried? I'm about my dad's business. He already understood part of his destiny at 12 years old. And he was in the temple preaching. He said, what are you worried about? Don't you know I've got a plan? Or that God's got a plan for my life? We see that at 12. And here, he goes to Samaria, completely out of the way to where they're going. He said, I must go to Samaria for one woman at lunchtime. I always like to throw that one in there. Because it says when they get there, it says the disciples were hungry and thirsty and they went into the city to get something to eat. <laughs> I haven't got there yet. <laughs> Don't ask me to pray for you at breakfast, mid-breakfast, lunch, snack time, dinner, or midnight snack. <laughs> I'm available about two and a half hours a day because the rest I'm eating or sleeping. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? But that's what I love about Jesus. He wasn't worried about it. He said, go ahead and he understood yeah. whether or not he said, go ahead and do what you need to do, but I've got to be right here, right? He had the plan, right? He knew what was happening because it wasn't even then. It wasn't just about her. It wasn't just about her getting right with Jesus. It was because the next thing that would happen, it said that she left her watering jug at the well and ran back to tell everybody. Yeah. Sometimes you got to leave everything at Jesus' feet in order to accomplish the destiny just before you. Sometimes Sometimes you got to forget what's going on in your life. You got to let go of some things. Yeah, yeah. Did I tell you the title of this this message? Yeah. Oh, it was throw your stone. <laughs> throw your stone. It was throw your stone. I completely messed that one up. There's supposed to be a nice build up to that and everything. <laughs> but I want you to think about this because the the whole thing about throw your stone is David had to pick up the stones on his way to defeat his giant on his way to his destiny. Right. Sometimes you might not have the perfect weapon. You might not have everything that you need, but don't let that stop you. Because here, here's the thing, you know, I understand that David was skilled. I, I've watched a lot of videos of people that, that they think that they kind of understand how that, that slingshot worked. It's not our modern day slingshot, you know, it's got the little arm brace that kicks back so you can get more leverage on it. Right? It wasn't anything like that. Okay. 
I mean, I've watched these guys, and a lot of them are extremely accurate. I've watched them do some crazy things, you know, from here, me to Cooper, probably, with some rocks. Now, one thing I haven't seen is I haven't really seen anybody do, like, some, some really cool magic tricks with that stone and slingshot from here to the back of the building. I haven't seen that. I've seen close-up stuff. I've seen him hit stuff that was, I've seen him hit balloons. I've seen him hit, like, flying targets and stuff. But they're standing still. If you read the story, it says, And David ran towards Goliath. I have never, and maybe I just haven't done enough YouTube research, right? But I have never seen a marksman with a slingshot on the run, loading their slingshot, and getting enough power on that thing to hit Goliath. Now, I just heard this over the weekend by, uh, from a guy named... Uh, Paul Haygood, I think I, I pronounced his name right. I think it was Paul Haygood. We, he was at the IMA conference this weekend, and this is one of the things that just kind of brought more of the story to, to light in me. It says that the area that, that they think that, they, that, they, that David hit Goliath with was approximately the size of a silver dollar. Now, it's, it's, one, it's one, yeah, in his head, right? It's one thing. I, I don't, I've got a big head, okay? One size fits all is a lie, okay? In a whole bunch of different areas because the of glove says it's one size fits all too and it doesn't fit these mitts, right? But here's the thing. I don't know how big a head on a nine foot giant is, but I'm hoping it's bigger than my head. You know, I mean, I know I got a big head, but let's come on. I hope the giant's head's bigger, right? So you got a pretty big target, right? But it's still the size of a silver dollar on that man's head, and he's hitting that at while he's running. I want you to think about this. If the giant is nine foot tall, his spear has got to be at least nine foot tall as well. Yeah, at least. Now, how far can a nine-foot giant throw a spear? Yeah, right. 90 feet. With accuracy. Yeah. I mean, remember, he is the greatest of all Philistine uh, uh, soldiers. Yeah. He's never been defeated. Right. I'm guessing he's pretty good. Yeah. So it wasn't like David ran up to him, you know, and threw it right at his forehead. Right. That's why I said to the back of the building, I think he had to hit him from a distance. Yeah. Because not only that, it says that after he fell, it said that he ran up to him yeah. to steal his sword. So he couldn't have been close when he did it. So the reason I named this throw your stone is he didn't come prepared for battle. Uh -huh. He came to bring his brothers yeah. grain and bread yeah. if, or whatever it was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But in an instant, he was ready and he trusted God because he said, you come against me with spear and sword, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. And today you will be delivered into my hand. Yeah. Right? And nothing about himself. It was all about in the name of the Lord, I come against you. Not in my abilities, not in my talents, not in my giftings, but in the name of the Lord. And so today you can take whatever the enemy, or not whatever the enemy, whatever the Lord has put around you and you can throw that thing. I truly believe that today that that stone was guided by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In my crazy mind, I can almost see myself, because I'm kind of clumsy, I can almost see myself in that instance, you know, and I start to wing it, and I forget to grab the other side of the slingshot, and the stone goes backwards, <laughs> right? As I'm running, right? But I still believe that because that, that ha even if that would have happened, I, I believe that God would have still guided that rock and smote the giant, because he did what he was supposed to do. Pam, yeah. I'm going to ask you to come. Today, guys, we're all in one destination or another on our way towards our destiny. Wasn't it Joseph, if I remember the story right, who at the very end of the story in Genesis, it says, what the enemy has meant for evil, the Lord has turned it around for the saving of many lives. See, see he only thought it was just about him ruling over his brothers and his family. But ultimately, it was a bigger destiny because it was the saving of many lives. It was turning things around. The Hebrew children wasn't just about them staying true to their, to their identity of who they were in Christ. It was about changing a nation because after they walked out of the fiery furnace, 
It said that, the, that it was it Nebuchadnezzar it stood up and said, and said, everyone who should worship the God of Daniel, right? And he goes on to, and says those things. That is what our destiny is, guys. Our destiny is about affecting that next generation. It's always bigger than us. It's always bigger than where we're right at, where, where, than where we are at the time. I apologize that I screwed my notes up, but hopefully you got something out of it. Father, I pray that today, as, as I'm officially making this an altar call, a time of decision. Lord, that today we would look at this story, that we would look at these things, God. And we would see where, where the world has tried to come in. We'll see where the things of life have piled up and got us so uh, restricted and so blinded that we can't see you. But Father, I pray that no matter where we're at today... In that destination that we're at, that Lord, that today you would make us realize where we're at by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would, you would convict us, that you would show us if there's things that we need to put aside, if there's people that we need to put outside of our life so that we can walk in the, in the true authority that you've given to us. Lord, that today we would smote our giants on the path to our destinies. Father, I thank you today, Lord, that you're a God that promises, oh God, Lord, a future. That you promised, dear Heavenly Father, so many things for us. All, dear Heavenly Father, in line with spreading the word of God and building the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we want to be about here today. So, Lord, if there's anybody here that needs to know you in a, in a greater way, if there's anyone here today, Lord, that needs to experience you in a greater way, whether that's healing needs, whether that, that's mental needs, physical needs, whatever it may be, Lord, if they just need to come closer to you, I pray, Lord, that today they wouldn't walk out those doors with making the right choice. Lord, we come against the enemy today. We know, Lord, that his only plan is to steal, kill, and destroy the destiny, the seed that you have inside of us for the future of your kingdom. Today, Lord, prosper all the seed. Let us go about your business in Jesus' name. Amen. As the worship team closes in prayer, I ask you to just uh, contemplate. Don't just hurry up and leave. It's, it's 11, 12. you got plenty of time to get to KFC. <laughs> Make Jesus the first thing. Make Jesus the right thing. If you need some time, the prayer workers can come forward to the altar. Let them go through this worship song and reflect on what God wants to do in your life. Amen.